Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did it for science. What power? What power? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you and glad to be back with you. Uh, interesting uh, program. Uh, Brother Drew was uh, answering questions and a lot of you folks were calling in. I'm glad that that was taking place. Glad to know you're watching. And uh, tonight, what we're going to be discussing is going to be kind of along those same lines as what Drew was talking about. Not necessarily, but we're going to be talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, that's what we're always involved in, I guess you might say. But before we get started, we're going to give you our contact information. We meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. My phone number is 276-340-2653. And a word from Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. If you'd like a copy of this program or we'd like to come visit with us, have a Bible study, we'd be glad to um, assist you in any way we can. We meet at uh, 9 a.m. for Bible study on, on Sunday, 10 a.m. for worship, and then we meet for... Bible study on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Of course, then we come down here to the station in Reedsville, and we uh, uh, do this live broadcast, and uh, we hope that you will take advantage of all these opportunities that you have to come out and study the Word with your friends from the Church of Christ. Church of Christ meets at 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville, as well as 120 American Legion in Danville. So uh, we want you to uh, uh, take advantage of that. Friends, as I said, uh, uh, at the beginning, we are going to be talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, when we talk about uh, studying to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, well, you need to realize, friends, that when you are trying to find out what the will of God is, it's going to take work. That's why, that's why uh, Paul says to Timothy, look, you're a workman. A workman is someone who studies. If you are not studying God's Word, not putting some effort into it, you're not really studying. It's not just reading the Bible. I hear people uh, all the time, they call in and they say, well, you know, I've been reading the Bible. I've read the Bible uh, every year for the last 50 years. Well, that's good that you're reading, but are you studying? You know, it's, it's one thing to be reading, but do you understand it? That's what uh, the Philip asked the, the Ethiopian in uh, Acts chapter 8. He said, understandest thou what thou readest. And so if you're not really understanding or getting the meaning of what you're reading, then reading is not doing you much good. It's not profiting you. And so what we're dealing with is having to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, handling a right is the idea there. And friends, you've got to use, you've got to make sure you're using the right tools to do that. Uh, if you don't, if you're not using uh, uh, common sense, or you're not using some of the tools, and I didn't get to hear all of uh, what Drew was saying, but you know, if you're not using that uh, the logic and, uh, uh, you know, really some common sense and understanding the Bible, you, you'll misapply the Bible. Let me give you an example. I just want to use that caller, the, the lady that called in to talk about the, the Psalms. Uh, I believe she used Psalm 149 to talk about the, the authority for instrumental music. I want you to consider this, friends. Let's just look at this. In Psalm 149, and this is really not part of my my lesson, other than it just kind of fits in right here. I'm going to put it in here. Notice this. Now, this is, a, this is the, the uh, verse that she wanted us to read. 
that she wanted to use. And so I want you, one of the one I, I believe, I'm pretty sure she used this one. But notice what, notice what Psalm 149 says. Praise you, Lord, sing to the Lord a new song and praise and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Uh, let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful to the king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praise unto him with the timbrel and the harp. For the Lord hath uh, taken pleasure in his people. He will beautifully, uh, uh, he will beautify the meek and the salvation. All right, let the saints uh, be joyful in glory. Uh, be joyful in glory. And let them sing aloud upon their beds. Now, let the high praise of God be in their mouth. Now, friends, I want you to notice something. Yes, this verse, this, this is a psalm, and it did say, uh, sing with the, the, the timbrel and the harp. Now, if that is your authority, you're saying, well, this is what we're to use because that's a psalm, and the psalms talk about instruments. Well, friends, you know what? This is what we're talking about when we're talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, sometimes it always pays to read that next verse. Because notice, while verse 3 does say sing praises with the, with the timbrel and the harp, look what verse 6 says. Verse 6 says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Now, you, I guess you have a timbrel in one hand and you're shaking it and you're rattling it and you're jingling it, but you've got to have a sword in the other. See that? Now, now ma'am, friend... Have you got your sword in your hand? I'm not talking about the sword of the Spirit, the Bible. I'm talking about a two-edged sword, a timbrel and a sword. Is that really what we're doing? Is that, is that really what we're talking about? See, we're talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, you want the timbrel, you want the harp, well, go ahead and have the sword too. Go ahead and have the sword. So that's really, that's just a little, uh, as Brother John Shannon said, just a little excursion. Uh, from what we're doing tonight, but we are talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I, I want to say, friends, that when you rightly divide the word of truth, you've got to have the right tools. You know, if you, if you don't have the right tools to do a job, then you're probably going to mess the job up. Uh, you know, I don't know that I would want to meet a, a mechanic that only had a hammer. You know, if someone's going to come work on my car and he says, well, all I've got here is a hammer. Well, you might can do something uh, on a car or something with a hammer. I don't know that you'd necessarily want to use a hammer on, on a car, but uh, if that's the only tool you have, then your tendency is to see every problem is a nail, and so you're just going to hammer it. Well, you know, some tools require a hammer, and some tools require a little more uh, finesse, maybe a little more fine-tuning, a little more precision. And so if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth, you need to know how to use the proper tool, because if you uh, uh, if you don't have the right tools, if you don't have the right tools in your toolbox, and then you may not ever, ever get what God put in the Bible out. And our job, our duty, really, is to know the will of God. Notice this in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians five and verse seventeen. Ephesians five seventeen. Paul says, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Our job is to understand what the will of the Lord is, and the way we're going to do that is rightly dividing the word of truth. So you've got to use the proper tools. Now, friends, I just can't stress this enough. Uh, if you use the wrong tools, you're not going to get the right answer. Or if you misuse tools, you apply them right, use them wrongly. You're not going to rightly divide the word of truth. You're not going to uh, handle or write the word of truth. And so I want to make sure that, that the tool that we're using is the right tool for the job. Uh, if, I, if I went to the dentist, I might not be surprised if he took a drill out. See that? He, he's going to use a drill. He's going to drill your tooth. But if you went to a doctor, a heart doctor, and you say, well, doctor, what tool are you going to use well, I'm going to use this drill. Wait a minute. I don't want you anywhere around my heart. You don't use a drill on somebody's heart. Now, you might use it to drill into a bone or to a tooth, but you don't use it to drill into the heart. And this is what we're talking about. When people approach God's Word, sometimes they don't know what tool to use, and they only have one tool. And so that's the tool they always use. Friends, 
That's going to get you in trouble. Here's what I'm talking about. You need to realize this. Let's talk about figures of speech. Let's talk about figurative language is what we're talking about tonight, really, friends. You see, you need to realize that God, he speaks to us. He's always spoken to man. He's always given uh, his will. He's always given man some information that man can use. In Hebrews 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, God has been talking. He's been revealing His will in different ways and different and various and sundry ways. So He's been talking. But the very fact that He has been talking to man, friends, indicates that He wants man to know something uh, uh, from Him, something about Him, something how to, how to please Him. He wants man to know what He knows. He wants man to understand what he is saying to them. So it stands to reason that if God has written something in this book, which is his word, then we can understand it. I hear a lot of people say, well, you can't understand the Bible. We can't all understand the Bible a lot. Well, listen, if God spoke to man, he intended for man to understand it. And he did not intend for man to have to go about and say, well, I think God might have wanted me to do this perhaps. No, he intended that you could know for sure what he meant. And that's why it takes study, it takes some effort. Because it's not always easy, but you can know it, friends, you can know it. But like we said, if you don't have the tool, or you're not using the right tool to write it divide the word of truth, you're not going to get out what God put in it. Now, let's talk a little bit about language for a minute. Now, God uses different kinds of language to speak to us. Now, I'm not talking about language like Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, which the Bible is actually written in. I'm talking about different styles of speaking, figurative language. Listen, when you read the Bible, you're going to find different kinds of language in the sense of you've got books of history, you've got books of law, you got uh, prophets. You have poetry. Now, if you read poetry, do you think it's going to read the same, or is it going to be the same kind of language that you'd read in a letter? Or is it going to be the same kind of language that you'd read in the, hist in the book of history? Sometimes I tell people I think uh, um, learning or memorizing where certain things are in the Bible are easier in books like First and Second Samuel or First and Second Kings or Chronicles because those are books of history and they, they read their, their narratives. They read like a story. Nehemiah and things like that. They, they read like a story and you can kind of remember, oh yeah, this is where you know, Nehemiah is building the wall or this is where uh, the flood is. and so on. You can read, remember those. But sometimes letters are a little different because they kinda, they're, just, they're just written differently. And so that may be a little harder. And so you don't read the Bible the same way. You need to understand these, these different types of languages are going to be different. Different kinds of writings are different tools that God's using, and you need to know how to use those tools. All right? So if you're writing a, you know, if you're writing a, a, a letter to your sweetheart, you, you're going to use some flowery, you know, colorful, buttery, you know, smooth-talking uh, romantic type words, that's not going to be the same as the letter that you get from a lawyer. See, that's going to be written totally different. And so they're going to read differently. And if you've ever read, read anything from a lawyer, you know that's, you know, that's where too far and here too far and the parties of the third and so forth. And it's all, you know, you have to have a master's degree uh, just to figure out what some of these words mean. You know, get out your, your dictionary to understand the meaning of some of these words. So God uses some different kinds of writings as tool, but he knows that we can understand this because he's using it to get a message to us. Our job then is to understand how to use those tools. Now, one of these styles of writing is called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic writing. I know it's a big $64 word, one of those words I just, I just said you might need a dictionary to find. But the word apocalyptic actually means revealed or made manifest or an uncovering. And so God uses these, uh, this type of language, which is 
really a, a style, if you will, to convey a message. Now, you find this kind of language used in, in books like Ezekiel and Daniel. You know, you've got wheels in the middle of wheels, and you've got winged beasts and, you know, faces of lions and eagles. And what, what does all that mean? Well, you can get the meaning of it, but you need to understand that you can't use the same tool on this kind of language, like Ezekiel, Daniel, and the Revelation, as you would, say, on the book of Acts, all right, or, or the book of 1 Samuel. You, you just don't use the same kind of tools. They're not, they're not written in the same style, okay? So you need to understand that this is a style that's used, but God intended for it to be used a certain way. Now, what do books like Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah and the Revelation, what, what do they have in common? You know, if you're thinking about these books and you're thinking about preachers you've heard on TV or preachers uh, that, that you've sat through and heard sermons that are out of Daniel and, and Revelation or you talk to your friend about the Revelation and, and so forth, one thing that comes to my mind when I think about all these books and what they all have in common is they're all confused. These books are all very confusing to some people or... People get them confused. There's a lot of confusion and uh, uh, misunderstanding about these books. Oh, because there's, why? Well, there's beasts and there's horns and there's seas and there's dragons and there's serpents and stars and all kinds of things in these books. And you need to realize right off the bat, this is written differently than the other books. These books are not written in the same style as the book of, of Genesis or the book of Exodus or the book of Acts or the a book of letter to the Galatians or Colossians and so forth. These, these are different styles of books. So you've got, you've got to understand that these kind of writings are going to require a little different approach, if you will. Now, it's not difficult to understand what is meant in the Revelation or Ezekiel or Daniel, but you have to know how to approach it. See that? Now, I'll, I would say, well, you know, uh, open heart surgery, that's difficult for me because I have no idea really what the body looks like on the inside. Well, you know, to a surgeon, he knows what to look for. He knows to go in, he knows what the heart looks like, he knows what the lungs look like, he knows how to get around and manipulate, and so he, he, might, not, he might not have a, a, as much trouble doing a surgery as I would. See, because I don't know how to approach that. I don't know how to get around in the body. But someone who has the right tools and the right training, they can get around and they can fix everything and put it back together. Same with the Bible. God intended for us to use apocalyptic writings like the Revelation and Daniel to, to get something because he put it in the Bible. He intended for us to know it. And I've heard people say about the, the, the Revelation of John. Well, we just can't understand that. Well, if we can't understand it, then why did God put it in there? God did not include this book in the Bible for us to not be able to understand it. It just may not be as easy to understand as some of the others. But it can if we've got the right tools. Now, as I said before, apocalyptic language, it means, it means to uncover. It means to reveal. As a matter of fact, if you look, uh, if, you're, if you're looking in your Bible, you see this word in Revelation 1, verse 1, the revelation. Uh, that word is actually the word, that, the, the original word, is where we get the word apocalyptic from. All right? And so... This word is, is, is really kind of, we're just kind of using the, uh, um, uh, the Greek word. You know, we're kind of trans, transliterating the Greek word to use the word apocalyptic. But that's the word of revelation. And so it means to reveal something. So the, the revelation is God revealing something to man. And God meant for people to understand it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called revealing but it's just revealing it in a way that maybe everybody's not going to understand it if they're not willing to work for it. You know, Jesus, uh, Jesus said that 
uh, about the parables. You know, his, his, his disciples were always asking him, you know, what, what does this parable mean and what about that parable? But if you'll, if you'll notice, Jesus indicated that the reason why he uh, spake in parables, and I think this is Matthew 13, uh, let me see here about, about the parable. Uh, why, why does he speak in parables? Verse of Matthew 13 and verse 10, let's just look at this. Matthew 13, verse 10. His disciples said, Why, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said un, unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not uh, given. Now, does that mean that other people couldn't understand it? No, it's not, not what it means at all. But it just means that if individuals who are willing to hear, notice this in verse, in verse 12, he says, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him uh, shall be taken. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So they just really didn't want to hear. They didn't want to understand. They weren't willing to look for the truth that was kind of being uh, put in a mystery. There was something being revealed there. But it just wasn't as plain, maybe, as, as someone just coming out and drawing them a picture, so to speak. And so when you're talking about this kind of language, it's the idea is to reveal something. Now, uh, friends, here's what we need to understand about the nature of apocalyptic writing. That is the key to understanding it. You have to, if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth and know what these figurative language means, you need to understand this very thing that the nature of apocalyptic writing, uh, books like Revelation, and the nature of books like Daniel, parts of Daniel and, and, and Zechariah, is that they are highly symbolic. And they are characterized by all of these symbols and, and word pictures, if you will. And if you don't understand that, like I said, you're going you're gonna to reach into the toolbox and you're going to say, well, you know what? I think I just need a, I think I need a hammer. No, what you need with this kind, you need a more of a precision tool. You know, you need, uh, you know, you need something uh, more precise. You know, uh, more like a, a, a caliper or something where you can measure some precise with. So you can't just approach these books like any other book. You've got to understand the nature of them different. And a lot of times people overlook the very fact that the book of Daniel has a lot of highly symbolic things in it. And so they're looking for literal things in it when the book itself is actually telling us it is not literal. There's the, the things that you're going to be reading are, are going to be word pictures. Look at this in Revelation 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and sent and signified it. He signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now friends, that word signified, that word signified here means to mark or to indicate. So it's pointing to something. Now, friends, we understand what symbols are. And we use symbols all the time. And we understand that those symbols stand for something else. If you're, going to a, if you're going into a restroom at a restaurant or maybe the store or something and uh, you say, I need to use the restroom and you go, you go down this little hall and all of a sudden you see a door. And watch, I'm going to describe this symbol and you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. You see a symbol that has a circle. It looks like a circle on top of a triangle. He said, well, that's the women's bathroom. That's, that's, what, that's the symbol for the women's bathroom. If you see a, sign, uh, a symbol over here, there's a circle with a little stick figure and two legs and two arms, just, that's the men's bathroom. Why? That stands for something. See, we understand symbols. We understand symbols. You, uh, uh, you're driving down the road, you see a sign. And uh, you, you may not can see the letters, but you know it's an octagon. And you see the color, it's red. That's a stop sign. Just the shape of it tells you something. 
See, it's a symbol. It stands for something. And so uh, we understand that. But when it comes to Revelation, the Revelation or uh, books like Daniel or Ezekiel, sometimes people go, well, I'm just going to throw common sense out the, out the door and I'm going to look at it like I would look any other book. Don't mess up, friends. You're not going to get the meaning. You're going to mess up. You've got to understand, it's telling us right at the beginning the revealing or the manifestation of Jesus Christ, the information that he is going to reveal, he's going to do it in this manner, by symbols. By symbols. Now, if you don't understand that, friends, then when you get to seeing beasts and candlesticks and stars and, and horns and trumpets and vials and horses, you're going to say, whoa, that's a scary picture. Well, it is scary, but it's even more scary if you don't know what those symbols mean. Now, friends, I, I think you should understand the, the nature or the idea of, of symbolizing something. I figure most people who are watching this show are pretty patriotic. And if I showed you a picture of the American flag, you'd say, yes, I'm, I'm proud of that flag. I know what it stands for. You, you what? It does what? It stands for something? It stands for something? Our Pledge of Allegiance says it stands for something. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. And so the, the flag is a symbol for our nation. And even the flag itself is full of symbols. The red and white stripes are symbols. The, the field of blue is a symbol. The stars are symbols. And they represent each state, you see. Thirteen stripes, thirteen colonies. Red for, for the blood, you see. Blue is for loyalty. All these things are, are, are symbols. Now, when you see the book of Revelation and you're reading through it and you start seeing these things, you need to say, hey, I need to pay attention here. This is not like a regular book. But yet people read it and they say, well, you know, these, these, this is, I'm going to read this like a regular book. You should realize right off the bat this is not a regular book. All the other books in the Bible, most of them are no, written nothing like the Revelation. The Revelation is, is a book of word picture. By, by the way, friends, it's Revelation, not Revelations. So if you call and you talk to me about the revelations, about revelations, I'm going to say right now, you haven't been reading your Bible very carefully. You've already, already added an S to the second word of the book. See? So in, the, in, in this kind of language, we're talking about word pictures. And friends, they can't be taken literally unless there's reason to take them literally. In, in books like the Revelation where you're seeing all these beasts and things like that, you need to realize, all right, this is figurative unless there's a reason for me to take it literally. Otherwise, it's all figurative. It's symbolic. Now, it's just the opposite in the rest of the Bible. The, the, the rest of the Bible, you look at it and say, well, you know what, this is just regular writing. This is regular words. And so we're going to take them literal un, unless there, there's reason to be figurative. But notice, so, so you need to understand that this is highly figurative, and you don't need to read into it. You don't need to say, well, I think this, this is a picture of Caesar, this is a picture of Pope, and this is a picture of Adolf Hitler, and this is a picture of, of Osama bin Laden, and I think this is, you know, this is uh, the World Trade Centers, and boy, you can get all kinds of things in the book of Revelation if you're not careful. But don't be reading these theories into it. Here's one way to do Friends, when you're reading through words like the book, the book of Revelation, look at this. Why don't you stop and see how the author tells you? Because sometimes the author is going to tell you what he means. For example, let me look at this. And I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to get through this because I know that um, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be running out of time and I'm, people probably want to call in. But look at this. In, uh, in Revelation 1 and verse 13, uh, verse 12, uh, John says, I, I, I turn to see the voice. Now, can you see a voice? Well, he's talking about 
he turned to see where the voice was coming from, who was making the voice. All right, that spake to me. And I turned and I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, did, are those literal candlesticks? We're going to see. Notice what he saw. He says, in the midst of the candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a uh, girdle. And the head of his hairs was white as wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, here's one thing you need to understand. If you're reading this and you're thinking, that's exactly what Jesus looks like? Friend, do you not see these key words right here? When you see a word like, as, as if, as the sound of, that's not, that's not to be taken as literal. I've heard people say, I've heard people say well, well, I know Jesus was black because he had, his hair was like wool. Well, friends, that doesn't mean that he was a certain color. This is John describing his hair was white like wool. All right? What if he said it was white like snow? Now, who's he? Well, Jesus is Frosty the Snowman. See that? No, no. See, it was white as snow. Well, now he must see. See what we're talking about? It's, we're describing. These are, these, are, these are metaphors. Similes. Excuse me, similes, like as. And so John is, John is telling us, he's giving us some descriptions here. Notice this, and he said, In his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Now, what is John talking about? Well, look, John's going to tell us what he's talking about. He said, this person said, Fear not, I am he, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And now notice, Write these things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Now wait, he's going to tell us what those seven golden candlesticks and those seven stars stand for. See, they're symbolic. They're symbol. They're symbols of something. And the author is going to tell you what they stand for. He said the seven stars are the angels. Excuse me that. Excuse me. The seven stars are the angels. Um, can, you drop the, can you drop the banner there for a minute, Richard? I can't get my screen to come up. The seven stars are the, uh, are the uh, uh, angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the, well, I still can't, I still can't get it. Uh, seven churches, okay. My, my, I won't scroll up anymore. It's going to the next chapter. Okay, thank you. So he's telling us, the stars are the angels of the churches and the candlesticks are the churches. They're standing for something. All right, thank you, Richard. So, my, my point is, friends, sometimes you just need to listen to the author. He's going to tell you what he's talking about, all right? Now, another thing you need to learn about figurative language is you can never, and this is about true with anything in the Bible, if it contradicts something somewhere else in the Bible, then you've got it wrong. See, the Bible is going to be consistent because it's truth. Psalm 119 verse 160 says, The sum of thy word is truth. So if you're reading through the, uh, the revelation and you're saying, well, this is what that means. If it contradicts something that John wrote somewhere else or it contradicts something that Paul wrote or it contradicts something even in the Old Testament, you're missing it. Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken, John 10, 35. And so you have to be careful here. Now, here's what we're talking about. When we're talking about figurative language, one of the things in figurative language is, uh, or one of the ways to understand it is, notice how people use these terms before. All right? I find it amazing. People want to go, well, well, well what does revelation mean? I want to do a study of revelation. Have you read the Bible? 
Have you studied the other 65 books? Oh, well, no, no, no. I want to go to the Revelation. Why? Friends, when you check a book out of the library, do you automatically turn to the last chapter and start reading it? You won't know who any of the characters are. You don't know who, uh, anything that's going on because you skipped to the last of the book. Why then do you want to go to the book of Revelation and say, hey, let's figure out what it means? If you understood what was going on in the first 65 books, you'd have a greater understanding of what's going on in the Revelation. Now, the readers of the Old Testament, the readers of Revelation, they'd know what's going on in the Old Testament. They'd be very familiar with it. And so sometimes the way to understand is say, ask this question. Is the meaning the same in the Old Testament as it is now? It may not be exactly the same, but I bet you get an idea about how, how the term's used. Let me give you an example. Uh, depending on where you're from, you'll use terms that other people won't use. When I, when I, my, my family and I moved up here in 1999, uh, our daughter was about uh, four months old, uh, two or three months old. And uh, as, as she got a little older, some of the uh, ladies, members of the church, they said, well, she sure is a smart baby. She's a smart baby. Now, I'm from Texas, and I'm thinking, now, she's a smart baby? She's, she's four months old. How do you know how, what, how, what her IQ is? So finally, we asked someone, and said, well, what does it mean when someone says, that's a smart baby? They said, well, that means she's well-behaved. You know, she's quiet, or she's happy, or... See, now, now that term, that phrase, smart baby, that doesn't mean that in Texas. Now, you may find someone that uses it, but I guarantee you, typically, you don't find people talking about good babies being smart. See that? So when you go to the Old Testament, when you go to the book of Revelation, you might need to go back to the Old Testament and say, well, how was this term used? For example, let me give you this example. In Genesis 37, in Genesis 37, uh, in verse 9, notice Joseph's having a dream. Joseph's having a dream. And he dreamed another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream uh, more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now, what did, those, what did the sun, moon, and eleven stars mean? Well, his father knew. His father knew. Notice this. And he told it to his, he told it to his father and his, and his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that thou hast uh, dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Now the father knew that the sun and the moon represented he and his wife and the eleven stars represented his brethren. Now, when you read then, when you read uh, in Revelation or you read in some other kind of writings, stars. They're symbols for something. They may be symbols for someone who is in a greater position of authority. Joseph's brethren were, were stars, and they were de definitely above him in authority as far as the family goes. And that's why it was, it was uh, uh, so uh, uh, insulting for them, for Joseph to come and say, well, you're going to bow down to me. See, so, so you need to understand how, how it works. Or if you see, uh, for example, if you see... In Revelation 13, and you, re you, you read where John says, I stood on the sand of the sea, and the beast uh, saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, what does that mean? Well, would that help you? Would it help you understand what this means? If you knew that Daniel, chapter 7, that Daniel saw a beast, notice this. He said, uh, he saw a great sea, and what happened in verse 3? Four great beasts came up from the sea. Now, does that help you understand maybe what Revelation is talking about? In Daniel, you're going to find out that these four great beasts were the four world empires that are going to come later. The, the, are the Babylonians, the Middle Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Now, so if you see a beast rising up from the sea in Daniel, wouldn't that help you understand what it's talking about then in Revelation? Now, so my point, friends, is you've got, you've got to approach these books a little differently. 
little and to understand them. Now, here's what we get to. There's something in the book of Revelation that people are all messed up on, twisted on, confused, and that has to do with numbers. Sometimes when you see a number in apocalyptic writing, like the Revelation or like uh, Ezekiel or Daniel, people say, well, those are literal numbers. Friends, numbers are not always literal. Sometimes they are, and sometimes, but sometimes uh, they, they represent something literal. Sometimes they represent uh, a, figure t- a figure or an idea. Like if I told you, well, I've told you this a thousand times. We've gone over this a dozen times. Now, have I literally said this 12 times? Have I really gone over it uh, a thousand times? Or am I using a number to demonstrate a great many times or a vast majority of things? See, numbers in the book of Revelation are something you're going to see all the time. And so you need to know how they're used. You need to know how they're used. For example, uh, if you don't know about numbers, you may take them literally when really they're symbolic. Now, how do you rightly rightly divide the word of truth? Now, let's get to something that everybody knows about. Let's get to this thousand-year reign. And I've said all this to come down to this, this idea about numbers. Friends, you will miss what God meant if you don't understand these things about numbers. I'm not talking about the book of numbers. I'm talking about the numbers and how God used them. Let's look at this thousand-year reign. Where do we get this? In Revelation, Revelation 20, John says, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, verse 2, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now this is where we're getting this thousand years. All right, now, let's stop there. How do we know what this thousand years is? Later on, let's go ahead and, just, and read, I guess. Let's come on down and read. Uh, he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years uh, be up and he'd be loose for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the, uh, for the, for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not... Uh, worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received uh, his mark upon their foreheads or in their hand. Uh, and they lived with and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right. So we got a thousand years uh, of this dragon is going to be bound and a thousand years reigning with Christ. Now here's the question, friend. Is this literal? How, what do we do with this number? Remember, if you're going to look, if you're going to look, if you're going to look at this book, you need to understand. I can't approach it like every every other book. I, I need to understand that we're talking about figurative language. Sometimes we're talking about metaphors and similes and and uh, this type of language. Now, the context is going to help you. If you if you would just use a little common sense when you're reading this, you'll have to say number one. If you, if you've got to chapter twenty and you think that all the stuff that you've been reading up to this point is, is literal, you, you're in trouble. All right, but in chapter 20, notice this. There's a dragon and a key and a bottomless pit and a great chain. Are those literal? Is there really a, a dragon and a key and a bottomless pit and a chain? Look again at this verse. Look in this verse. Remember what we said about let the, let the author, let the one who's writing the book tell you what he's talking about? Look at verse 2. The angel that had a key in his hand to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, he laid hold on the dragon. Now, what does he do? He tells us who the dragon is. He tells us what the dragon represents. He tells us that the dragon is a symbol. 
What does the dragon represent? He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil. He tells you exactly who he's talking about. He tells you exactly what the symbol of the dragon is. Now, if the dragon has a symbol, if the dragon is a symbol of Satan, then don't you suspect that the key is a symbol of something? And that the bottomless pit is a symbol of something? And that the chain is a symbol of something? And therefore, therefore, it stands to reason that the thousand years is a symbol of something. It's not literal. It's not a literal thousand years, friend. Now, you, you need to understand this. Because a thousand years is a, is a term that's, that's used to stand for an undetermined period of time. And it's not just in the Revelation. Sometimes you'll find it just in, in, in everyday writing, like, like the Psalms. Look at this. In Psalm 50, Psalm 50 and verse 10, the psalmist uh, says of God, every, or God says, every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle up on a thousand hills. Does that mean that all the beasts belong to God in the forest? But God only has possession of the beast of the cattle that are on a thousand hills? So if there's a thousand and five hills over there, God has all the cattle on a thousand of them and five of them somebody else has. No, it's a way of saying that God has all of them. They all belong to Him. If you go to Walmart on a busy Friday right before the race, you know, you go to Walmart right before the race or right before the holidays, you'll say, man, everybody, what was, what was Walmart like? I think everybody and their brother was there. Was everybody at Walmart? Yeah, everybody and their brother. Well, everybody didn't have a brother. See that? It's figurative. All of Reedsville was down at Walmart. All of Martinsville was at the racetrack. No, they weren't. It's just a way of saying it. it's a It's a term to to show a great number, or undetermined number. Same way with uh, uh, Psalm 90. Psalm 90 and verse 4. Notice this. For a thousand years is in, the, is in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Now, someone says, well, you know, Peter says that um, to the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, and uh, let's look at that, 2 Peter 3, 8. I'm going to come back to Psalm 90. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Now, what does that mean, friends? Is that saying that every thousand years, one day has gone by for God? So, so we've been here since, since Christ is born. There's only been two days. Two days has passed since Christ was born? No, friends. It's just showing that time does not matter to God. Now, if we look at Psalm, let's go back to this. In Psalm 90, in verse 4, look at this. A thousand years in thy sight are but yesterday when it is past. And as a watch in the night. Now, friends, a watch in the night, either if you're talking about uh, Romans or our, our, our Romans or Jewish time, you're talking about either three or four hours. All right? So let's say, let's say three hours. I mean, four hours. Four hours. A Jewish watch was, was, was um, four hours. I believe that's right. Now, are you going to say a thousand years is as of yesterday or is it as four hours? Which is it? talking about how fast it goes by. It's just, a, it's just a blink like that. God does not, is not bound by time. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, friends, is because people don't understand numbers. And by the way, when it comes to, when it comes to these numbers, uh, like a thousand years reign, friends, have you paid attention to the verse that you, that you just said? In Revelation 20, Revelation 20, in verse 4, notice this. Revelation 20 and verse 4. Who is reigning here? They lived, the saints. The saints lived and reigned with Christ. 
a thousand years. Friends, Christ is already reigning. Christ has already been reigning 2,000 years, if you want to get right down to it. Notice this, in Acts, 20, Acts 2 and verse uh, 33, I think I typed in 23, Acts 2, 33, Peter said, he said, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, where is Christ now? On the day of Pentecost, Peter said he's sitting on the right hand of God. He's reigning right now. He's sitting on the throne. So he is already reigning. Now where do you get the idea that Christ is not reigning yet? See how, how, how it starts having a, a domino effect of, of bad news? Now you say, well, Christ is going to come and he's going to reign for a thousand years. Well, number one, he's already reigning. He's already been reigning for 2,000 years. And number two, if he's not reigning, then what do we do with his kingdom? Because his kingdom has already come. And number, and number three, what are you going to do when he comes back? Look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority, and all authority and power. Jesus already has all rule, all authority, and all power. If he comes back again, he's not going to be reigning for a thousand years. He's going to give up the authority that he's already had because he is reigning. Now, friends, if you're looking for Christ to come and reign in the future, You've already missed a boat. He is already reigning. He's already sitting on the throne. He's already sitting in power. All right? So, you see what, you see what I'm talking about? When people misunderstand, they don't understand these numbers, they approach uh, writings like the, the Revelation and not understand the nature of these, these figures, they start getting in trouble. And it starts conflicting with what we've already discovered in other parts of the Bible. I hope this is helping. I hope it's helping. Let me get one more point. I, if you got a question, call, call on in. We've got about four minutes left. Uh, so call on in. Now, what does that think? What does that say about other symbols in writings like, like this? The Jehovah's Witness, our friends Jehovah's Witness, think that only 144,000 are going to make it to heaven. And you know why? It's because they go to places like uh, Revelation 14. Revelation 14. The Bible says, uh, <clears throat> and I looked, and, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's na uh, name written uh, in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping, with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before four beasts and the uh, elders, and no man could learn that new song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which are redeemed, which were redeemed from the earth. Look at verse four. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, I want to show you the the contradiction and the confusion that comes from not understanding things like how God uses numbers in this kind of writing. Look what the Jehovah's Witness say. This is something that was that was handed. One of our one of our uh, brethren uh, was asking them, and they gave him this information. <clears throat> and this are and I hope you can read this. I I know it's kind of very difficult, but it says the Apostle John wrote about these uh, one hundred forty four thousand. And uh, right down here is where it says, it says their, uh, their, their number, 144,000, is, is understood literally for several reasons. All right, so it's a literal number. There's an actual 144,000 people that are going to be in heaven. Now, it's the same problem that people have with, with that thousand years and that dragon and that chain and that key and that bottomless pit. Look at this. Now they say, 
144,000. 144,000 are not defined with women. It says, the 144,000 described as standing uh, with the Lamb on Mount Zion are said to have been uh, bought from the earth. These are the ones that did not defile themselves with women. In fact, they are virgins. Now, that's what the New World Translation says. In fact, they are virgins. <clears throat> All right? And it says, uh, this would indicate uh, this would indicate that they are, are not defiled. It says, um, uh, let's see here. I'm, I'm losing my place here. Neither would it imply, <coughs> it says these are, are virgins, would not mean that none of these 144,000 persons had ever been married. Now, wait a minute. If it's a literal 144,000, how come it's not a literal virgin? And how come they're not literally men? See, all of a sudden, the only thing in this scripture that's literal is this number. And it says, neither would it imply that these were men, for they are neither male or female. And it says, the women, therefore, must be symbolic women. Doubtless, religious organizations uh, such as Babylon the Great and her daughters, false religion organizations. So, let's look at the text again. They say the 144,000 are literal. There's actual, the actual number is 144,000. But they haven't defiled themselves with women. That's symbolic. They are virgins. Well, that's symbolic. They are male. Well, that's symbolic. Everything's symbolic except this one little number that we want to use. Now, friends, this is my point. Why is it then, why is it then that everything else is not literal? Why do you just take the number? It's because they have a doctrine that is based upon this literal number. Now, friends, can you see the confusion that arises? Can you see the problem that comes about from this? We've got just a, about, about a minute left. Here's what I'm going to say. Friends, here's what I want you to be thinking about. Why is it that people tackle the more difficult books and verses and they insist that they want to know what those mean and they insist that this is what they mean. And yet, they miss the plain and simple verses that talk about salvation and the one church. They just miss that. There's one body and one church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the one body is the church. And the church is the body. And there's only one, Christ the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5, 23. You must be a member of the church of Christ to be saved. And the way you do that is you believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, you repent of your sins, you confess Christ before man, and then you're baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. Now that's simple. That's an easy verse. Nothing hard about that one. But yet we want to pass over that. We want to jump right to Revelation. Friends, I encourage you. You need not worry about the Revelation. You need to worry about making sure that you're right with God when the end comes. I'm out of time, friends. I hope this has helped. hope it's helped make you uh, uh, think about uh, how to understand the Bible. Until next time, if we can help you, this is how you can reach me, 276-340-2653. I always ask for what does the Bible say, and you always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. $50 million in the last quarter. As sales were down almost 4%. There are six family dollar stores in Rockingham County, three in Martinsville and Henry County, and one store in Pennsylvania County. The company is based near Charlotte. And uh, once again, we do not know yet whether any stories in the Star News area, any stores in the Star News area will be affected. Once there were eight candidates running for the four open seats on Danville City Council's upcoming election, but Madison Whittle announced Wednesday that he's dropped out of the race. Whittle is known for his business investments in retail, commercial, and residential properties. The Forum on Piney Forest Road is one of them. They also include Whittle Square at the corner of Piedmont Drive and Mount Cross Road in the retail market, as well as residential housing of over 125 homes in the city. Whittle said, and we quote, I was anxious to serve the citizens of Danville and work with city council. Regretfully, at this time, I'm withdrawing my candidacy for the Danville City Council. I wish to express my gratitude to those who've supported me along the way, particularly those who donated their time and resources to my goal of serving the community through public office. 
Next week, there will be another city council and school board candidates debate held in Danville. Stay tuned to Star News for information concerning next week's meeting. And now for the weather, we go to Matt Smith. Well, the days are getting longer and the weather getting warmer. Hi there, Matt Smith, Andrew Star Weather in high definition. And uh, take a look at this. This is that brand new fountain they've got on the entranceway to Danville, Virginia. And it is looking pretty out there. Heading down south for this picture, guess what? It's nearly 90 at St. Augustine. Florida. Uh, the uh, wind, just a very light wind, and uh, things are, are looking mighty good down south. And also in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia beaches, all those are looking super good today. At uh, the Bar Harbor Resort, which is all on Myrtle Beach's Grand Strand, uh, you see here lots of uh, people out uh, taking a stroll along a pretty quiet beach and uh, well taking in the pier as well at Virginia Beach. Uh, things pretty much the same. Uh, you can see a very calm sea off the coast. Uh, nearly cloudless sky down there at the beach too. Uh, people are just taking advantage of that and getting some of those first rays of the year, including our old Mark Childry. Yes, Mark is at the beach. And looking out over that uh, beautiful picture here, uh, no rain showing up anywhere in the southern U.S. Things are pretty, including the star viewing area. Our old star Doppler radar shows uh, no moisture-laden clouds or anything like that that's going to mar an otherwise beautiful time and a beautiful weekend coming up. In fact, the next real rainmaker we've got may be on Monday, more likely on Tuesday. Now, high pressure taking advantage of the fact that there isn't a lot of moisture in the system. It's building in solidly across the Southland and out west as well. As we uh, look at the uh, web satellite picture, you can see a few clouds around the middle part of the country, but otherwise lots of sunshine. I don't care where you are in the area, it is looking good. Temperatures in Orlando, Florida at 79. Dallas, the warm spot at 82 today. And uh, Billings, Montana, 51. Tied with Seattle and Portland for the cool spots of the day. Well, your forecast calling for not too bad of a day for the rest of the day and into tomorrow as well uh, Friday Saturday Sunday Monday it is gonna be nice out there temperatures in the 70s all through the days lows at night are gonna be in the 50s so keep it right there and uh, we'll keep informing you on the weather star weather brought to you by the uh, folks at autos by nelson.com check them out on the internet or at any of the Autos by Nelson dealerships located all across Martinsville and Henry County. Hey, stick around. Ken Eccles is coming up for you next with more on the news. That's next as Star News continues right here. I'm Dr. Joseph Canardi with Reedsville Veterinary Hospital, 3202 Barn Street, Reedsville, and I'm very proud to share with you some of the technology that we have at Reedsville Veterinary Hospital. We're fortunate to have new in-house digital radiology, which allows us to take a radiograph, and that can be viewed any place in the world in seconds if we need a second opinion. And we have a full service in-house lab, so we can get lab results within 10 minutes. We have a modern surgical suite that is equipped with up-to-date technology to 